Thank you very much. Hello, uh, I am Andrew Godwin, as you've just heard, and I am here to talk to you about reinventing Django for the real-time web, um, or as it's codenamed, channels. So first of all, who am I? I'm Andrew Godwin. I'm a Django core developer. I currently work at Eventbrite as a senior software engineer, and my favorite pastime is complaining about things, and particularly networking in this presentation, as you'll see. Um, but really, this talk is about Django and the web. And for a long time, we have talked about Django in the context of HTTP, of WSGI. The idea where all you do is you take a request and you return a response. Think about your standard Django site or your standard Flask application or anything in Python that runs web stuff. It's all written in this way where you write code that just acts on a single request, handles that request, makes a response, sends it off, and it's done. There's no long-term state. It's a very nice, scalable solution. We have good ways of handling that kind of stuff. And if you think about how it works at a stack level, it's turtles all the way down. Not only is this how Django works with views, you know, in Django, views take a request and return a response. This is how WSGI works with Django. In WSGI, you are recallable, that you get called with a request, and what you return from the call is a response. The same is even true of the web server. The web server receives a request over HTTP, and it returns a response. And this is all very nice and orderly. Like, you know, it's a very simple pattern. We can write against this. It's even not too bad when you bring in HTTP2. It complicates things a bit. In particular, you can send multiple requests at once and sort of pipeline them in one connection. But you can still write code that handles it the same way. You can still individually take those requests, make the responses in two different threads, into worker processes, whatever you like. But it's still entirely possible. Things get more complicated when we look to the current web, however. If we think about what the web is now, we have our brand new exciting feature, WebSockets. And WebSockets are not a wild west, but they are very different. You can send whenever you want. You can receive whenever you want. You can send without receiving. You can have giant gaps between sending and receiving. You can have a socket open for hours and then send one thing and close it. It's a very different kind of interface to your web server. Like, it's nothing like this request response model we've had before. And so you sit there, you look at Django, you look at WSGI, and you think, huh, what do we do? And this is a question that we've had as a community, as Django and as Python for a while. And there are solutions. There are various different solutions for doing WebSockets, some of them really nice, some of them less nice, but none of them quite fit what I thought Django should be doing. Let me explain what that is. When I think of Django, I think of its job as a framework. And its job as a framework is to bring you features that fulfill a certain contract and sort of fit the mold of Django. And, and this is some of those things. Like a feature in Django is generally very easy to use or get started with. It is generally secure by default. We, you know, we have baked in authentication permissions. We have a big security policy. It is usually very hard to shoot yourself in the foot. Um, a lot of Django is predicated against stopping you sort of doing obvious errors that look fine in your code, but actually result in massive security holes. For example, CSRF vulnerabilities, very hard to see from code, but Django can help stop those before they start. We're Python 2 and 3 compatible. But more importantly, everything in Django is pretty much optional. We come with opinions, and we say, OK, as Django, this is what we think is best for you, but we also say, and when you have grown out of it, you can take that part away and replace it with your own thing. And so a solution has to fulfill all of these, in my opinion, to be considered Django-ish. And some of the ones we have already come near that. But let me bring you to the second problem. So Python is not particularly good at concurrency. And even if it was, it's still, it's still a process. Like, you know, imagine Python was fantastic concurrency, used all the cores on the machine with one process. Like async IO has taken over the world. We're all really happy. You're still limited inside the one process. You can't do that across machines. And then also, even then, Django, as we stand right now, is not async compatible. Generally, an asynchronous compatible function has a different API, it has a different way of interacting with it. And so we don't want to have the barrier to WebSockets be rewriting all of Django. That's not feasible. We can't do that. 
And so we turn to things like Erlang and CSP, and we look at things like message passing, which is a very traditional, tried and tested way of doing concurrent programming. What you do is you have processes or threads or whatever that are entirely separate, and you pass messages between them. That's how you communicate only between threads. And this kind of maps to the WSGI model, if you think about it. What's happening inside your Python process when you're running a WSGI server is the WSGI server and the WSGI app have this defined interface. Like It's not done as message passing, it's done as a callable, but you could think of it as the server passes the request over to the application and, and gets the response back. And in WSGI servers that are threaded, it actually is a messaging system. Like, for example, GUnicorn can run with worker processes, and those act in a very similar way to this. But let's think about WebSockets. Now, WebSockets look very different to HTTP connections, because what happens is normal web connections, HTTP connections, come in, you run through them, you close them, they're done, they go away. You can cycle through them really fast, you can load balance them easily, it's all wonderful. WebSockets are not so nice. WebSockets hang around for a while. Like, their whole purpose is to open and stay open because their job, like, the, the hole they're filling is the ability to have a single persistent connection that you can do stuff down very quickly. And so, when you have a socket, a WebSocket server, you end up with hundreds of sockets clinging onto each server process, mostly idle, but still there anyway. You just have to do things with them occasionally. And initially, you think, oh, well, you know, that's fine. We can treat it in a similar way to WSGI. You know, it's a tried and tested method. We'll have a main sort of piece of code that interacts with stuff. It's not a WSGI server, because WSGI doesn't work here, but a similar kind of structure. And then we'll have worker threads that service the requests as they come in. Now, this initially seems fine until you remember one of the points of WebSockets is things like broadcast or events or pushing things. Imagine a live blog. There is a single editor sitting at her desk, typing away, filing blog posts, and there are thousands and thousands of people looking at the blog with an open socket. And every time she saves something, she saves it, and all of them get pushed an event in the browser saying, oh, there's a new live blog post, and it loads in immediately. If you think about how that looks here, what happens is that the process she's saving things into is somewhere in one of these many processes serving sockets or requests, but the sockets they need to send to is basically on every single machine in the cluster. Suddenly, we have to break out of our single process model and communicate that event to every single thing running our site. If it's a very small site, it's probably one still one process. It's fine. If we're a big site, that could be multiple different machines, like across a network. And this is the fundamental problem you have when trying to map not just WebSockets, but the use of WebSockets to something like Django. Like, WebSockets themselves can be dealt with, but how people want to use them and presenting a good API for people to actually use them with requires you solve this problem too. Like, Django's job is to solve the hard problems. This is the hard problem. And this is kind of what Channels does. What Channels does, it goes, that arrow in the previous slide, we're going to formalize that and make it a channel layer. And it actually deliberately breaks out those two halves that a WSGI server has, the bit that talks to HTTP and the bit that runs your business logic, into two separate processes. And not only different processes, you can bundle them together or you can have different ones entirely. They can be on different machines. And the idea here is twofold. First of all, because these things are already in different processes, you have, you have solved the problem of broadcasting to everything. Any one of these workers can talk to all of the interfaces that are holding all these sockets open. But secondly, you solve another problem that I have a lot, which is that asynchronous code is great, and I've been writing it for a long time now, and I enjoy writing it when I'm writing it, but I don't want to have to write everything in that style. I don't want to have to be constantly tiptoeing over the minefield of, if I put the function in the wrong place, my performance drops out or I cause a deadlock. And so what's nice here is that we can take our nice, tight, asynchronous code that handles thousands of sockets at the same time and decodes them and does the protocol handshakes into one process, or in one thread even, both is possible, and then have our business logic, our Django views, our Django code, as it is now, running in a synchronous worker thread, just in a loop servicing event after event. And this leads to a nice situation where, with very minimal changes to Django, we can turn Django into this evented solution that doesn't just work for requests, 
but works for all the different kinds of events that can happen with WebSockets as well. And you might be thinking, well, Andrew, this is scary because what you've just said is that my entire website has to run through a single central thing, and that's a very valid problem to have with this slide. And so the next step is to then say, well, most of the time you can handle things on the same machine. You can say, well, you know, most socket requests or normal web requests don't have to do this broadcasting. And you come up with a two-tier system where most of the communication stays inside the process, and then you still have this backing layer that can go across machines. But the point is it looks the same, and it routes based on what you want to do. And this is the basis of a lot of like, bigger architectures as well. But the, cha the challenge is bringing this into Django in a sensible way that you can use and isn't crazy, and you can deploy easily, and we can scale, and all those other challenges. So if we think about what we have, what it boils down to is two different concepts. And you can pick different concepts. These are the two I found the best to settle on for channels. Um, you have a concept of a channel. It is a named first-in, first-out task queue. That is, it's basically just it's a queue of things. You send things onto it. They go at the back of the list. And then you can receive things from the front of it. And they're named, because, so that means you can address them from different processes perfectly fine. Otherwise, you have to like, pass around pointers or something. And that's a way of doing things like handling work. You can imagine like a request channel where you put all the requests on the channel, they sort of pile up, and workers take request options off the bottom and just handle them as they get to them. That's, that's the task queue part. And then for broadcast, you have a separate thing called a group. It's a group of channels, and you send to the group, it just sends to all the channels. And you can add and remove things from that group. And in fact, you can encode those as five simple API endpoints, which is send, Receive many, which is many because you say a list of channels to receive from. Because, for example, one process could handle HTTP requests and WebSocket messages. So you want to receive from both. And whichever one happens first, you'll take it. And then you have group add, group discard, and send to group. This is, this is the very basis of that model. And let's go back to that thing I said at the beginning. In WSGI, in HTTP, you take a request and return a response. And what I really wanted out of this project was something that was similarly elegant and nice for WebSockets. And what we have here in Django is that. This becomes this. The new abstraction is you receive a message and you send zero or more messages. Let's look at a picture of that. Here we go. At the top is the old style. You take a request, you return a response. It's called a view. Django has those. At the bottom, you have the new thing, the consumer, it takes a message and returns zero or one messages. Now, you can see immediately a view is a special case of a consumer. This is a nice thing. We'll come back to that in a second. But let's think how that relates to using WebSockets. What we do is we take WebSockets and we work out what are the events in a socket's life cycle. There is when the connection opens, there's when you receive a message, and every time you receive a message, and there's when the connection closes. And so we take those three kinds of events, and we make a channel for each of them. And we can tie consumer code to each of those kinds of events. So for example, when someone opens a socket, I can write a consumer that just sort of looks at the open socket, records who it is into a database, and then just does nothing. It doesn't have to return anything. I could have one that, when it receives a message, looks at the message, works out what it wants, and it can then send a message back on the channel that goes back to the web socket. Because channels don't just go to Django, they come from it as well. Every connection you open, WebSocket or HTTP, comes with channels going both directions. WebSockets have a receive that goes to Django, but the send comes from Django to that process that has the socket open, that's waiting for the data. And for that reason, those return channels are named individually, like this. They each have an individual name that says, I am the return channel for this particular socket somewhere in the system. And that means what you can do is send that particular channel and it routes to the right place and goes to the right open connection. And this is kind of true with HTTP as well, if you think about it. You have a single channel where all requests come in. Any one of your workers can service those requests. They're, you're not picky. All the workers are running the same code. Like, say you have 20 workers. They're all fine. So you have one big channel with all the requests on it. But when you send a response, it's going to a particular browser that has a connection open. 
So the response channel is, okay, it's a response with an identifier for that response. And this is a general pattern channels has. There are channels that can be serviced by lots of workers. These are normal channels, as you can see here. Receive is one of those. Request is another for HTTP. And there are channels which are single process channels, like channels where the only valid reader is somewhere on the network. They're split out with this exclamation mark for reasons of scaling we'll come to later in the presentation. But it's a good conceptual split too, understanding that like, you're encapsulating the flow of data between your application and the client both ways. And what we're doing is taking that net pro network protocol and turning it into a series of high-level events that you operate on in your code. And that's the basis of all this stuff. You receive events from channels in Django, you handle them, and then you take those events and send more events back to the reply channels or to groups. And in particular, when you receive an event from a request or from a WebSocket, it comes with the channel saying, hey, this request came from this reply channel. So you have that place to tie the response back to. Let's stop talking theory and look at some code for a bit, because it helps a lot. First of all, I want to put this in here. Installing channels is very easy. Even though I have entirely changed what Django does, it is two things. You install channels, and you add it to your installed apps. There is a full installation document with the, sort of the caveats of that, but it does just drop in, and it replaces run server and all other stuff to work as you wish. And once you've done that, you can just start writing consumers. So let's go back to our live blog example. Our description of the problem, this is a very simplistic description, is we want people to get new blog posts as they are published without refreshing. It's a pretty good description of a live blog. Let's decompose that into what it means in the world of channels. Like, what does it mean in terms of channels, of messages, of events, of, of groups? Well, what it means is when someone opens that web page of the blog, they open a WebSocket to our server. When that socket gets opened, it gets added to a group of, oh, these are all the sockets waiting for new news. And then when we save a new blog post, we just send to that whole group saying, hey, there's some more news. And because every socket that connects is, added, is in the group, sending to the group sends to all sockets we have connected. And in code, that's this. You have one line in your connect handle that says, when somebody connects, add them to the group. So this is the basic syntax of channels. It looks very like a view on purpose. Um, every consumer takes a single argument, the message. It's like the request, but a bit more low level. And so in this case, we take the message, we have a group object called live blog. That's how we identify the group with the string. We say, hey, the message is reply channel, which is the thing that tells us like, where to send things to the WebSocket. Put that in the group. So as everyone connects, this code gets called every time a connection happens and builds this group of connections. And then deep in the save method in the model schema, we can put, OK, when you finish saving, open that group again and send this to it. And what we send here is a WebSocket reply format message that says, hey, send them a text WebSocket frame, and the text in that frame is a JSON encoding of, of this. Now, you'd send more than this, this is for, for sort of concise reasons. But you can see here that as soon as I save, every single person who has a socket open is going to get that WebSocket send pretty much immediately, within a matter of milliseconds. And that's what you want. That's the sort of broadcast we're looking for. That's the that's solving the hard problem that if we just gave you protocol handling, you'd have to solve yourself. Let's look at another example, chat. A very popular WebSocket example because chat is one of those very busy protocols, right? You could take a live blog and sort of do polling, it'd be all right, but chat's much more real time. And let's build a very simple chat server. Our chat server will just be a single room. You connect, anything you post, everyone can see it. Problem solved. Let's decompose that problem again into what it means in terms of channels. So when people connect, we put them in a chat group. Great. And when we receive a message over WebSockets, we take the message and broadcast it to the rest of the group. And it actually is that simple. Uh, in six lines of code, you'll have a chat server. Um, it's very simple. It's just echoing stuff. But all it's doing is the same concept as before. You build this group of people who receive a thing, 
And then when an event happens, in this case, we receive a WebSocket message, we can take the text from that message and just send it back to everybody else. There's one missing piece here, of course. You're wondering, well, Andrew, how does Django know what functions to run? Well, like urls.py, there's a routing.py where you say, for this channel, you run this function. And it even looks like urls.py. And even better, it has filtering like urls.py. You can do things like, oh, by the URL, go to this different handler, or by method, or in fact, any one of the things um, that a message has in it. But it's all very much that same kind of idea. Now, there are some important notes, because for brevity, I did not do three hours on this. Um, this is a very simplistic version of those examples. Now, things that go around this, run server when you install channels just works. Like, you can write this code and just do manage by run server. It will boot it up with full WebSocket support, run your consumers. Internally, it's actually running everything in, in different threads. You know that diagram earlier with all different components, they're just, they're just in one process threaded together. Um, and it's very easy. Like, you just download it, run it, and you can just develop with WebSockets straight away. Django sessions and auth work with WebSockets throughout as well, just natively. Um, if you host both of them on the same domain, WebSockets come with the cookies from your browser. And so there are just decorators we have, we supply, where you say, hey, for this consumer, just decode the cookies and give me the user object. And so you can just have WebSockets that people can just open from the normal JavaScript context, the cookies ride along, and you get a fully authenticated, secure, identified WebSocket. We say, like, well, this person is definitely Andrew. He has admin access. We can, see him. We can show him admin events. And you can use that to sort of put someone in different groups, like say, oh, this person is an admin. They get put in the admin events group. This person has a username group for their own username. And so if somebody logs in from three or four tabs, the username group reaches all their tabs. There's also generic consumers, which is a way of encoding common patterns like this as a single class-based consumer, like class-based views in Django. And finally, because code on slides is a terrible way to teach people, um, there are, in fact, fully written working versions of these with much more features. They have authentication and different chat rooms and stuff at this URL on GitHub. You can download them, you can clone them, and they'll just work. And more importantly, they come with descriptions of what they're doing, how it works, lots of comments, and a few tasks for you to use, like say, hey, now try doing this and see how it affects how the code works. So if you learn by doing, this is a great resource. But that sort of shows you how we can tackle a lot of tasks with these three concepts. Channels, which are sort of our way of tying events to running code on them. Groups, our way of broadcasting or multiplying one event into many. And then messages. And I've kind of skipped over messages until now because what actually is happening here is to make all of this work, those messages that the, representing the events have to be in a common format. We can't just be sending random stuff like, there has to be a certain kind of message that comes through for a connection, so you know where to look for the headers, so you know where to look for the cookies. And this is very much like WSGI, because WSGI has a common format of, hey, when you call a WSGI application, you get an Enveron dictionary that has a defined format. It's specified in, in one of the peps, it, it's all good. And so we kind of have to do that here as well. Like, what's actually happening here is we have specified message formats for what requests look like, what responses look like, how we encode the headers, what a WebSocket connection looks like, what a, what a WebSocket close looks like, all that kind of stuff. And on top of all of this, we have this cross-process abstraction, the idea that these three fundamental concepts you can run from anywhere inside your system of servers, and they will always work correctly. And combined, that becomes a whole system. And when I was writing channels, um, initially the startup was like, oh, this will be the internal implementation of things. And then we looked at sort of database backends like, well, there's a defined external um, interface for those. So, okay, let's make it defined and specify what it looks like, and then we'll be okay. And then it sort of turned into, well, we can just specify this fully and have a full specification for what does it mean to be something that transports that across the network. And that is where what is called ASGI comes in. So ASCII is the underlying specification that drives channels. It is, the, it is two things. It is a specification for 
what a object looks like that lets you transport things. So you know those five functions I showed you earlier? Those are what it has to implement. And it specifies the message formats you transport things over. And with those two combined, you can have common code that understands that it opens the back end, receives many on HTTP.request, and, and knows what to expect in terms of message format when it comes through. It has the whole lifecycle done. And more importantly, there are three different versions of this, or rather of the underlying layer. So as I said before, there has to be things to be cross-network, and there's different levels of that. So the Redis layer, which is the reference layer we have, and are shipping and sort of doing examples within Django, works across an entire system of machines. You point your boxes at one or more Redis servers, and it uses Redis to transport things across machines if it has to. If that's a bit much for you, you don't want an extra process, you're quite a small site, um, there's the POSIX IPC backend that uses shared memory segments to talk between different processes on the one box. And so without any extra servers, you can just say, hey, you're on the same machine, just talk to each other using shared memory segments, and that sort of handles that stuff. And finally, if you're all in one process, um, if you're that smaller site, or if you're just running tests, there is an in-memory backend that is like, it's thread safe and just uses different decks and stuff in memory. And these are all implementations of the ASCII spec. They are all pluggable options that you can take in and put in channels. And if you think about the diagram I showed you earlier, that's not just true of the center section. Like Those three are options for that purple center section there. But there's also options for the other parts of this diagram. Because once you have a specification, you can actually swap out everything. And so the interface server, that piece of code that I said, like, oh, this terminates WebSockets, this terminates HTTP, that doesn't exist without the Channels project. And so Channels is not just the Django side, it's also Daphne, which is the code that lives as a separate, separate project, separate repo on GitHub, and its job is to be a server that takes HTTP and WebSocket and speaks as the other end. Its job is like a WSGI server, but with this new different specification. But it's not just that. It's an open spec, so you can have any number of things there. And in fact, somebody's working on a new, an alternative one already. But another thing we can do is we can plug WSGI in that end, because, well, WSGI's a spec, and ASCII's a spec, and they're pretty compatible with HTTP, at least. And so there's an adapter where you can just say, well, you can actually have a WSGI app, and that app just talks into an ASCII backend and out again. And so if you want to have something like Unicorn on the front end and serve HTTP this way, you can still use this system in that sense. In the center, as I said, there's different options for the channel layer, depending on your different requirements. And the idea is that there is a full spec. Everything is defined to a slightly extraordinary degree in that spec as, as far as we can. And so if one of these doesn't suit your needs, well, you can modify it and change or make one that fits. And then finally, the worker servers. Now, all along I've shown you Django examples. Like, this is a Django project, Django channels, all that stuff. But of course, nothing is preventing you from having something that isn't Django doing this stuff. And in fact, one of the goals here is to have something that slightly transcends Django, something that sort of solves the broader problem of WebSockets and this kind of system design in Python. Because like, as I said, the difficult part is the broadcast and the grouping and all that kind of stuff. And to solve it just once for Django and continue our thing of like, oh, it's like the RM is like so deep down in Django, you can't get it out, it seems very foolish. And so, in fact, this is designed so anything else can log into it. Um, what is coming up is a, a WSGI adapter the other way around, where you can run a WSGI app as an ASCII app instead, and it sort of does this dance and runs things the same way. But you can imagine any other system could be developed as well. And in fact, the consumers I showed you earlier were pretty small, but you can write a raw ASCII piece of code in only about three or four more lines. So it's really not that difficult. And you can combine the two of them because what I'm not going to do is stand here and go, hey, we have this cool new thing that does WebSockets, and to use it, you have to make your entire site run this new thing that Andrew invented last year. It's not going to sell. And so the nice thing is, because of the way the channel layer is written, you can run both. Um, you can send into the channel layer from anywhere. Sending is a non-blocking operation, so synchronous or async code can both call it. So what you can do is you can do this. You can have a situation where 
you run all your normal stuff on the normal WSGI app and WSGI server that you've always had, and that can still call out and send things down the channel layer. In particular, things like when you save a blog post, send a notification to all people on the live blog. It can still do that. It can't receive from it, but you don't want that. And then over the other side of a system, you still have these interface and worker server processes, and they're still serving WebSockets and other things, but they're isolated away. And so you can pick and choose what you feel comfortable with, and then if you want, for example, HTTP long polling, which WSGI cannot do, but channels can do, because channels is split out in that way, um, you can move that stuff over to the ASCII side as you wish. And there's a lot of stuff that kind of builds on this too. The final question is scaling. Um, even in this diagram, there's still a single bar there that goes across, in theory, your entire project, which even something like Eventbrite is a considerable uh, size of, of number of servers. And so the question of scaling does come up. Now, a lot of the existing solutions don't scale very well, and my goal was to find an architecture that would lend itself well to scaling. Now, I have some experience in the matters, not as much as I'd like, but quite a bit. And if you think about it, even in the model we have now, interface servers, the things that service sockets from browsers, scale horizontally. You can just launch more and more of them and just like round robin your connections to them and like scale them that way. That's fine. Worker servers also scale horizontally. You can just add more of them and they'll get through work faster. They're just pulling it off. But in the center is that one thing, the channel layer, it has to scale as well. And so the built-in Redis layer has a consistent hash-based sharding built-in. Um, remember when I showed you earlier those two different kinds of socket and how one had an exclamation mark in it? That is because you root those two kinds in different ways in a scaled system. And that's deliberately there so a backend can know how to handle the different kinds of sockets. And this is all explained more in the docs, but it basically lets you build a much better system around how you distribute this stuff as well. And this is something we'll be developing on and proving out. Um, we have somebody already right now um, under our funding project running bigger and bigger load tests, trying to understand how it behaves at scale and what we can tweak to make it better. And other approaches are possible. Channels is deliberately, or ASCII is deliberately a very thin API with just enough pulled out that it's good to use, but enough left to the implementation that different scaling methodologies are possible inside it. And so what does this all mean for Django? Like, what, is, what does this look for the future? Well, first of all, that's the question of what is Django? Is it going to be in Django? Um, we missed the 1.10 uh, alpha deadline, which was a few weeks ago. And so, and you know, also, I think for some very valid reasons. And so the question is, how does it look for being called Django? Should it even be part of that core Django package? Now, the first step we'll make is we are going to make it if the resolution passes, I'm sure it will, an official Django external app, something you haven't had before. We're going to have a new status for apps. There's like this, this package is maintained by the Django team. It's subject to the same security policy, to a similar backwards deprecation policy. It just isn't the same. It just isn't Django itself. And you still have the same guarantees and the same management team, and it's put under the Django GitHub repository and that kind of thing. So that's the first step. And then the second step is looking at merging in either 1.11, our next LTS in eight months' time after 1.10, or 2.0, which is kind of a nice dramatic, like, aha, we changed it all in 2.0, um, but quite far away. So we'll see about that. And then a lot of it is like maturity, right? Like, as I said, I'm coming in here going, hey, hey, guys, it's a great new idea about uh, WebSockets. And it's not mature, right? Like, this runs in production and some stuff, but not as the scale that I would be comfortable with as an ops person deploying on a large site. And so a big part of this is like ramping up the scale of projects using this, running our load tests, learning from production installs, and really getting that difficult problem that it's our job to solve down really well. And it's so like by the time, probably like you know, a few months' time at least, if not longer, um, we'll have this very concrete set of like, you know, this is how you run this stuff in production. This is like the sort of performance issues you might see, and this is what you want to tweak or change based on your load style. And there's a big part of this community. As I said before, like Django's job is to be somewhat opinionated because having opinions and having a standard base to build off is what breeds community and breeds interoperability. 
And so that means having a good, thriving set of third-party extensions and uses and like extra sets of generic consumers, having people write tutorials and write-ups and case studies about their use of channels. And this is all the thing that I think makes Django really good. And this is stuff we have to aim for and build and do outreach for as well. There's coexistence. As I said, not everyone needs WebSockets. They're not this crucial thing like database migrations everyone needs. Um, you have to make sure that they're easy to add in and to drop if you don't want them. And so for that reason, like this is very much built as this is not a sea change replacement. This is a, well, if you want this, you can either like run a new server for it, or you can run everything through the same server with a bit of changes. There's some options there. Like if you're a small site, the local, the local IPC backend is probably fine. And just trying to have that sort of really easy, like frictionless route in and out. So you can like you can play with it. Like, would a feature be better with WebSockets? It's now like, you know, an hour to try that out rather than like a week or two. Expansion. One of the things I didn't even address here is that while this is designed for WebSockets and HTTP initially, eventing is a common thing. And you can event on many different ideas. And one of the things that um, both of these are being developed now is a chat and an email interface server. The idea being that you can write consumers against incoming emails or against incoming messages in IRC or Slack or something like that. And like suddenly Django becomes this much more powerful framework to build event-driven applications rather than just web applications and really grow into that role as the back-end service for the new modern web. And then finally, specification. As I said, ASCII is not Django-specific. I've tried very hard to keep the implementation and design of it separate from Django's requirements. And I fundamentally believe that WSGI is lovely for HTTP, but is not going to work for WebSockets. And so I am looking to at least reach out to the rest of the Python community and, and talk about having some kind of common standard that we can all agree on for things like WebSockets that might look something like ASCII or even be the same thing. And that's something to bring up as, a, as I go through the months and with formal specifications, but if you're interested, come and talk to me. I'd love to go through it, especially if you're like an, another web framework or have similar concepts. Finally, if you find any of this interesting, I have written a lot of documentation. Uh, this is, in many ways, a documentation-first project. And this channels.readthedocs.io is the site for all of that stuff. There are tutorials, there are reference documentation, there are notes about scaling, there are notes about deployment, there are alternatives of deployment with different strategies. And then, as I mentioned earlier, there are these this repository of full work examples. So if you learn by reading, then you can read the docs. If you learn by trying, experimenting, you have examples. And if you learn by listening to talks, I hope you've learned something. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew, for a really nice talk. We have time for a few questions. Uh, please come to the microphone. Go ahead. Uh, no. Can you imagine this might be useful for uh, background tasks as well? I thought I saw something in the abstract. Yeah, so one of the things you can do is um, you can make your own channels and just send onto them whenever you want. And so you can say, oh, this is the thumbnailing channel. And whenever I have a thumbnail request, just send onto the channel and just have consumers tied to events there. Um, it's not as reliable as Celery because it's, you know, Celery has retries and all that stuff and built in, but it's good enough for most codes. Yeah, that, that's one thing you can do. I sort of couldn't fit it in here editing-wise, but that is definitely a thing you can do. Thank you. Thank you for the talk, Andrew. It was very clearly presented. Um, so a couple slides that you had sort of implied uh, the possibility of a channel backend that was sort of dual layer uh, and could intelligently uh, root maybe within a machine using IPC or in memory uh, when it knew that any worker would be fine or whatever, and would it, but would still give you the sort of second layer of, of falling back to Redis or something network-wide when yeah. you need to do broadcast. Is that kind of hybrid channel backend a thing that exists or just a thing that could exist if someone built it? That one exists as a post up on this machine here, um, and, but it's, it's not yet ready. So it, it kind of works. Um, the, I, I prototyped the principles of it, and this is the thing that, like, a lot of the feedback from the 1.10 push was around that kind of thing. So, like, I think it's very important to develop it, but like, it's it's proven in prototype. But like, hopefully, in the next week or two, I'll get out to public release and consumption. But yeah, it, it definitely works in in testing. Awesome, thank you. 
Great talk, Andrew. Thanks. Thanks. Um, uh, you mentioned it in your docs that uh, maybe Daphne isn't quite ready for production, but I don't know. What's your current thinking like as of today? Uh, you also mentioned that maybe running it alongside uh, Gunicorn or USG might be a better solution. What would you, what would you suggest right now? So I, I find it very hard to recommend things for production because I see like, oh, we ran this medical device system on this thing. I'm like, oh, no. Um, Daphne is, <laughs> yeah. Daphne is very stable. Like, the nice thing I've had, Daphne is mostly just twisted code, hot glued together with me. Um, and so in many ways, it's actually very stable. Um, I've never, like, there's, there was one bug where malformed URLs broke it. We fixed that like two or three weeks ago. Um, so like, my, my, my current opinion is, it is the most stable WebSocket thing I've seen by far, because it's not a very mature field. I'd still run HTTP on Unicorn or something similar. And then over time, as Daphne proves itself, I would move more and more stuff over. Like long polling in particular, as I said, my, my first thing to move over to, to Daphne. But like it has to, for me to recommend it like unreservedly, probably take two decades. So we'll probably sort of somewhere in the middle of like, you know, a few months at least of testing it before I start recommending it for small sites. Hi, great talk. Um, I hate to overload your project, you know, already, but um, on the HTTP2 side, yes. if you're um, sending a response, say HTML, and you say, hey, I think you should also have this image, is that two messages? Or? Yes, so that, that is HTTP2 server push. That is specified in ASCII, and there's implementations for it. Um, so. Twisted's HTTP2 support is still being written, so there's not a server for that yet, but we specified how to do it. And so yes, you would send one response, one response style message that is the server push of the image, and then another one that is the final response. And so once that lands in Twisted pretty soon, we integrate it, Django can then send server pushes natively, which would be really nice too. And you start, we can start working static asset pipelines, just send things ahead of time and just as part of Django. Thank you for the talk, Andrew. A uh, quick question on um, how does this integrate with something like Django tests? Yeah, that's a good question. So there's a Django test subclass for this stuff. So um, a bit like transactions and databases, every time you start a new test, it, could, it makes a, a new um, in-memory backend and links into that and reroutes it properly. And there's also sort of a test client that's very similar where you're like, okay, so like test message clients and that kind of stuff. And, and so it's, it, there is, stuff around it. Um, so you can test like, hey, make a channel, send stuff to people, what's the response like, and so on. Hi, Andrew. Yeah. Thanks for all the hard work. Thank you. Um, perhaps an unfair question to put, pose to you, but you're introducing a channel layer that's shared across presumably many different processes, whether it's on yes. a machine or not. There's the potential of a single point of failure. What's the failure mode look like? Broadly? That's a very good question. So ASCII has a defined failure mode, which is um, Delivery failure. So it, it is in particular, it is a at most once queue. Um, your choice being either duplication or failure of delivery. Um, and so it is, it is designed, and a lot of the helpers are designed to absorb a certain message loss rate. So for example, there's a disconnection handler in ASCII, but also the things like the group membership clean themselves up after a while in a way that handles message loss. And so there is some aspect of having designed for that, but you have to design for one, like it's still a distributed system. You have to pick one of the two trade offs. Um, and the trade-off we have picked, we tried to put a lot of tooling around that, education about like, okay, you'll probably lose like 0.001% of messages, you should deal with this. Um, and, and a lot of tools to handle that kind of thing too. Cool. And you'll forgive us if we expand it as the Andrew server gateway interface, yes? <laughs> no, that's, it's, it's asynchronous is what the A stands for. <laughs> We're just about out of time, so maybe one quick question. Okay. Um, yeah, I was wondering if you had thought about support for server sent events, and the second question would be about a, using a Postgres's listen notify as opposed to Redis for the multi-machine bus. Okay, so very, very quickly, um, server sent events are just a extension of the HTTP one chunked encoding. Um, channels, you can send chunks as like different messages, so that works fine. Um, secondly, Postgres, um, listen notify is broadcast, to do a channel backend, you need a queue system, not a broadcast system. In particular, you need one that only one listener receives at a time, whereas let's notify every listener receives at once. It doesn't quite fit, unfortunately. But yeah, there, there are other options. OK. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ron. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.